Would you say to set this on the keyboard? Or? I think so. So we can get rid of this. I've, I've done this once before. So it scares me to death. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the service from the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence. I'm Craig Dreesen. I'm on the Stewardship Committee and Safe Relations. It's wonderful to see you here this morning in the Great Hall and online. Um, thank you for everyone in the helping make the service happen this morning. If you're new or returning from a time away, we're very glad to see you. Feel free to fill out a blue welcome card, which you can put in the offering plate later in the service. There's also an online version that you'll find through a link in the chat. We'll put you on the email list so you can receive information about our activities. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, religious beliefs, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Unitarian Universal Association of Congregations and we are guided and inspired by its values and principles. Our values and principles remind us that here in Northampton, we inhabit the unceded lands of the Pocotuck and Nipmunk peoples. They remind us to acknowledge our responsibility to face the legacies of dispossession and systemic racism that are part of our collective history, even as we also affirm and celebrate the legacies that inspire us. We're here to celebrate, to reflect, and to support each other in sustaining hope and upholding our values. If you're on Zoom, we ask you to please keep your videos off except during the greeting. And if you're in the Great Hall, thank you for wearing a mask. For families, classes are happening for crawling babies through eighth graders. Early childhood and middle school classes, fifth through eighth grade, now start downstairs. Kindergartners through fourth graders start in the Great Hall and go downstairs after the story. Fidget tools and drawing supplies are available in the back entrance for everyone. And now we'll begin our service. <laughs> I'm so glad that I've been given the perfect kind of day to sing this song, almost like I planned it.
Holy are the places of memory, the places which have formed us, where we store the icons of success and shattered dreams and gather threads and pieces of what we would become. Holy are the places of change and pain, the places of struggle where the rivers of our lives run white and fast and we hold on hold on and grow. Holy are the places of connection, the places where we risk ourselves, where hands touch hands, touch souls, touch minds, and in awareness still, we change our lives. Those are words from the Unitarian Universalist Minister Maureen Killeran. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we say the words to accompany lighting our chalice and Laura will light it for us. May the flame we now kindle light the path to our center, to what is true, to what is deepest within, and to what knows us even before we know ourselves. Our story is by Charlotte Zolotow, and it was published in, oh, I shouldn't tell you how long ago. It's brand new. No, it was published in 1978. Has anybody, does anybody know this story? Oh, yes. I have this feeling someone is gone, and I don't know who. My mother is here, my father is here, my sister is here. Who's gone? I lie on my bed and I look at the wallpaper. I chose the wallpaper in my room last year. It was red and blue. It had red and blue balloons. There was another paper that looked like wood. I wish I had chosen that. Something is strange. I don't like this wallpaper anymore. The doorbell rings, one short, too long. It's my friend Jack. Hi, he says. Hi, I say. Do you want to come out? 
I say, what'll we do? Want to play marbles? I like to shoot marbles. No, I say. What do you want to do? He says. Take a walk? So we take a walk. Jack is with me, but someone's missing, and I don't know who. Back home, Jack says, what about this afternoon? And I say, I don't know yet, and close the door. My sister is playing with blocks. She likes me to build for her. And when I get the last block on top, she knocks them all down and laughs. I like to hear her laugh. Build, she says. No, I say, and I go upstairs. I go into my room. The balloons are floating on the wall. The bed is made. Bear and Panda are sitting on it with their arms reaching out. I push the arms down. I look at my shelves, books and bottle caps and baseball cards and the box of shells from a summer at the beach. I pick up a shell. It has a twisted shape. It's pink and white and gray. I take up each shell one by one and I arrange them on my bureau and stare at them. I never really looked at them before. I never thought about them, how they were washed up from the sea, what lived in them. I remember that summer at the beach. I wish I could go back now and find more shells and find out about them. I look around the room at all the junk, games, bottle caps, bear and panda, as though they belong to someone else. I get a grocery carton and pack up everything except some of the books and the shells, even bear and panda. I want them out of my room. I'm glad I'm not seeing Jack later. I want to go to the library. I want to get a book on shells. I look at the box of things I'm sending out of my room. Panda's arm is sticking up. The feeling I have is sad, but happy too. Someone's gone, someone's missing, and I now know who. He's in that box with all those things, and I am someone new. Now we're going to sing again. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing hymn number 128, For All That Is Our Life.
to greet one another. Where are all my, oh my goodness, we have 45 screens. So, wave to the people in the back. People in the, people on Zoom, you can turn on your videos if you want, so we can say hello to you. Hello everyone. Sarah, good to see you. Melissa, Melissa from New Mexico. Sally, good to see you. Alice, Evelyn, Barbara, who else is there? Sarah Hunt, Molly, Kirby, good to see you. Gail, Steve Johnson, Abby and Mark, Andrea, oh my goodness. Fran, A Andrea, Look at you all. Hello, Eleanor. Hello, Jean. Joan, Kim. Too many names. Justina, good to see you. Christopher Stetson. Hi, Chris. Claire. Hello, Greg. Wally and Paula. The Porters. Linda, Janet, Joanna, David, Rich. Oh, Inestra, good to see you. Hello, Sally. Old habits die hard. I had to bring this back. We didn't have it for a long time. We didn't have to do it during uh, the, during COVID because there was no one here. <laughs> And now it's time to sing out everyone who's going to religious education activities. This reading is um, something written by Amanda Pope, who's the senior minister at the UU Church in Arlington, Virginia. She says, sometimes our becomings are dramatic. We realize that the gender we thought we were or others thought we were isn't correct after all. Or we discover that the career we had planned or the marriage we had begun isn't really who we are or is no longer right for who we have become. Sometimes our becoming is gradual, a kind of unfolding and changing and shifting over time. Always it is lifelong, which isn't to say we aren't already who we are. We are that, too. We are already ourselves the minute we're born and every minute after. However long our lives end up being, we are our full selves every second, every month, every year. And we are also always becoming, always growing, always stretching. In the growing time of my life, my soul experienced something like the growing pains I remembered in my legs as a child. I became a minister, a mother, a middle-aged person. It's usually been uncomfortable and almost always inconvenient. The old me seemed fine, the one I was just yesterday. Why bother with all this shifting? And yet, when I come out the other side, I invariably think, ah, yep, this is the me I was supposed to become. This is who I am. Until next time. Who are you going to be today and tomorrow? Who are we all becoming together?
The generosity we share here makes everything we do possible. And it also helps support organizations and movements in the greater community. Half of the proceeds of the offering each week go to support the uh, work of the society and the other half goes to organizations that have been chosen, nominated by members of the congregation and then chosen by our uh, coordinating council. And the list of the ones that we're supporting right now are up on the screen. We also supported um, the effort for Yes on Vote, Yes Vote, Yes on Four, which was, of course, an outgrowth of our uh, immigration work and our sanctuary effort. And I don't know, our, our uh, former sanctuary resident, Arita, put on her Facebook page, I can't vote yet, but please vote yes on, but go vote and vote on four. Or you vote yes on four. I don't know if some of you probably saw that. Um, so you can mail in a check, you can donate online, you can put your contribution in one of the plates that the ushers will pass. And um, if you have a blue card, you can also put those in the offering plate. Our offering will now be given and gratefully received.
Our meditation this morning is the well-known Langston Hughes poem, Dreams. And after the silence, the choir is going to sing a piece by Rosa Fania Powell based on uh, something that Langston Hughes wrote. So they're his words. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Let's take time together in silence.
This is a poem by William Stafford called What It Is, which is what I, where I borrowed the title of the sermon as well. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing you have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do stops times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Now I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing the autumn hymn number 54, Now Light is Left. Thank you. 
So as you heard, this morning's story is about a boy who's growing up, sensing that he's changed and unbalanced for a while by the difference he feels in himself. And it reminds me of my own sons in their various stages growing up. And I love the part we said, the half, half happy, half sad. It's very poignant. It also calls to mind the verse from 1 Corinthians, which is the letter from the first century Christian missionary, Paul, to the church that he founded in Corinth in Greece. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And then William Stafford's poem seems to be a little bit of its counterpoint, suggesting that there is something, or more than one something in our lives that are, that's constant. How do you interpret the thread? The thread that others can't see, the thread you don't ever let go of. One way to see it is as a through line of ourselves, the self we were and still are, whatever was and is about us that hasn't changed and that doesn't change. You might also think back to see if you can remember in yourself a time when you noticed that you had changed. I thought of a time when I was 11 and I remember playing with a friend who told me I had become boring because I was no longer interested in the make-believe adventures that we used to enact in our backyard. Yeah, I was boring. And another memory from my teens, my late teens, which I've forgotten, I've probably shared it sometime here in the past, but I hope you've forgotten it too. Um, <laughs> I read Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. Oh, do you remember I told you that? Oh, no. Noel. <laughs> <laughs> I read it the summer before I left for college, and I found it really amazing, deep, moving, with its philosophical ideas and story were just profound. And then the following summer, after a year in, in college, I reread it, and I thought, this is trivial, this is simplistic, this is, and I was amazed to realize how my way of thinking and my understanding and my, the way I analyze things had changed so, so radically in that year. Now, it occurs to me that that was 50 years ago and I haven't read it since. <laughs> so maybe I should read it again and see what I think. Amanda Pape writes that we are our full selves for every second, every month, every year of our lives, and that we are also becoming ourselves in all that time, growing, stretching. So the other thing to ask yourself is when you have changed, what has gone and what remains? What about you has been constant throughout as much of your life as you can remember it? What made you happy when you were five? When you are ten, when when were you were when you were ten, rolling down a grassy hill, climbing trees. What about when you were eighteen? Does any of it make you happy still? And would your ten-year-old self recognize you today as the person you were at ten? What about your eighteen-year-old self? I, I think maybe that through line is more like a braid or a rope, different threads wound together, strands that have endured. It could be core beliefs, love of nature, love of music, family love, family quirks and traits, an innate tendency we might have to be shy or outgoing and gregarious. Or maybe it's something, a vision or a passion or a gift that we relentlessly pursue. So about a month ago, my husband Booker and I went 
to the Berkshires for the weekend. We spent a weekend with friends and we saw the Edward Albee play Seascape, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in 1975. So it's an old play. Charlie and Nancy are a couple in late middle age, retired. They have children, they have grandchildren, and they're on the beach having just finished a picnic lunch. Nancy loves the seashore, and she tells Charlie that she wants to stay there forever. Charlie thinks, ridiculous. It will get cold, is what he tells her. We can go south, she says. We can go from beach to beach. We can go all around the world. Charlie says, I don't want to do that. I've earned my rest. <laughs> but Nancy wants more. What has made you happy? She asks him. What made you happy when you were a boy? Didn't you tell me once you wanted to live in the sea? And he says, yes, I wanted to be able to go under, to live down in the coral and the ferns. And when I was older, I would go into the water. I would take two stones as large as I could manage, swim out a bit, relax, and then begin to go down, soft landing without a sound. You can stay down there so long and around ferns and lichens, and the fish do come, all sizes, some slowly eyeing past, some streaking, and one stops being an intruder, finally, just part of the undulation and the silence. It was very good. Nancy wants Charlie to recapture that happiness. Go and do it again, she urges. Go, do it now. You'll love it, Charlie says. No, <laughs> the idea is embarrassing and absurd. Somebody would see him. They argue. They go back and forth in this play a lot between arguing and reminiscing. <laughs> and I found it hard to picture Charlie as a child, weighted down with stones, having enough breath <coughs> to stay under while fish came by. Could he really stay that long? I really wanted him to have a snorkel. but. <laughs> Edward Albee was not worried about what was believable and what wasn't, because the other two characters in this play are talking lizards who can walk upright. <laughs> so Charlie and Nancy are interrupted by the sight of two human-sized creatures standing on the sand dune about 10 feet away. And they, they had fabulous costumes. They were shiny olive and green and black, huge taloned gloves for the feet, black circles around the eye, some, a little bit of a beak, black around the mouth, a fin, and this long tail that swished when they walked. It reminded me of a dinosaur costume I made for our son Elliot once, except it was three times the size at least. So Nancy shrieks and Charlie roars when the lizards appear and they freeze and then Charlie orders Nancy to find a stick. She finds something absurd. And he takes a step forward and the bigger lizard lifts a foreleg in which he holds a huge cudgel. <laughs> so Nancy and Charlie prepare to die. And then there's a huge roar from a jet overhead, which happens periodically during the play. And the lizards retreat in a panic, disappearing behind the dune. Charlie says, we're dead. What we just saw isn't real. Therefore, we're dead. It was the liver paste we had for lunch. It was old. I told you not to bring the liver paste. <laughs> so they argue for a while, and then the lizards reappear. And at this point, Nancy and Charlie get on their backs in the position of submission with their feet and legs in the air. That's the end of act one. And then the second act starts in with them in the same position, but um, things progress and the couples begin to get to know one another. The lizards, whose names are Sarah and Leslie, speak perfect English, but they have large gaps in their vocabulary and understanding. So words for emotions, for example, are foreign to them, although it's clear that they have emotions. So Nancy's and Charlie's attempts to explain the concept of love lead to a conversation about how Leslie and Sarah met and about procreation. Do you couple? Of course we do. Sarah finds it incredible, though, that Nancy has only three children, and Nancy finds it equally incredible that Sarah has had 7,000 or so, and, 
really has no idea where any of them are. Most of them floated away. So why are these lizards there? What is the point anyway? And Sarah begins to explain. We had a sense of not belonging anymore. It was a growing thing, nothing abrupt, nor that anything was different for that matter, in the sense of anything having changed, but we had changed. All of a sudden, everything down there was terribly interesting, I suppose. But what did it have to do with us anymore? And it wasn't comfortable anymore. I mean, after you make your nests and accept a whole array of things, and we didn't feel we belonged there anymore. And what were we going to do? So we came up out of the water. All that time, Charlie muses, the eons. Life on Earth began in the water. Evolution and change are fundamental forces of life. And change is the only constant. The credit in Western philosophy for saying that first goes to Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher who lived about 2,500 years ago. He said, existence is like the flow of a river, always moving and you can't step twice into the same river. So there's change, and then there are our through lines, the braid we don't let go of. So two of mine that I can think of, going back to my childhood, was I was always one of those kids who thought and wondered about big questions. And I wanted the world to be a kinder place. So in what ways do we change? How do we evolve? I grew up in a white suburb and had very little personal contact with anyone who wasn't white until I was in my teens. I also grew up, as many of you did, during the civil rights movement of the late 1950s and the 60s. I knew about race and racism before I was 10. And I don't, my, my grandfather's father, my grandfather on my mother's side was adopted and my grandfather's father was half black and half Native American, which I don't remember knowing until I was in my 20s. But my mother was very committed to, to civil rights and I think that is, it was a personal, experience of hers that influenced that. She had known her grandfather. So I watched the 1963 March on Washington. I was 10, I was 10, and heard Dr. King make his I Have a Dream speech. And I knew that racism was evil and wrong. Racism meant prejudice and discrimination against people because they were black. That was the definition of racism that I grew up with. And there's a thread in my through line braid that represents the need to be good. So what I learned was that bad white people are racist and good white people are not racist. 50 years plus have gone by and I have learned and forgotten and relearned in new ways that it's a lot more complicated and insidious than that that racism has been built into the structure of Western thinking and institutions for over 500 years, since before the age of discovery that began 500 years ago with Magellan and then colonialism and imperialism. And it's been built into the structure of our institutions and our culture and our education and our ways of thinking. And it's affected and ourselves and it's affected all of us, black and white. It's in us. So I've also learned and recently, reluctantly, come to notice and accept that I have racist reactions. I don't like them, but I do notice them. And I have to, I know, and I have to tell myself what matters is how I behave and what I champion and what I support. And what matters also is that I continue to learn and grow. And I also know that many of the workshops 
I'm guessing some of you shared this experience. Many of the workshops in which I participated over the years, some of them led by UU ministers, were not helpful. They didn't reach me where I was. They made me feel misunderstood or blamed or shamed. They made me feel, pulling on that string, they made me feel I wasn't good. And now I'm guessing that they and I and we're all doing the best we could. And that I know we can all get better at this and it's the work of many lifetimes and it's important work. And so in one aspect of the way I've changed, as a counter to my through line, my, my braid, I've, st I've started to understand what it means to be anti-racist. And I understand why so many lay people and leaders in the Unitarian Universalist movement are asking us to give anti-racism a central place in our work as a faith community. That's why I support it. And I know that they and we and I will continue to evolve. So where are you changing and growing? And is there anything like for Sarah and Leslie that is urging you towards something new? Evolution is a fundamental force of life and change is the only constant. And as William Stafford wrote, there's a thread you follow. It goes among the things that change, but it doesn't change. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit the words from Maureen Killeran with which we began the service. Holy are the places of memory, the places of joy and serenity, and the places of change and pain and struggle. All of them, all of them have formed us. Holy are the places of connection where we dare to take risks. And holy are the braided threads that sustain our being and our becoming. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me in singing hymn number 1008, which is in the Teal Hymnal.
May all our hearts find a holy place. Go in love and hope and go in peace. Thank you.